in chapter 16, verse 18, if you remember where Jesus said he will build his church. Starting with Peter and the apostles, yes, God started a new community, a new family. New creation is a new family. And it's a family that's operating out of the transformation that these first disciples, these apostles, experienced while walking side by side, seeing Jesus, talking with him, being with him. It was there in, that, in those verses first called Ecclesia, the church. The early church lived way closer than us. They lived uh, more co communally. And, and when you're together that much, I'd say living together or even meeting together frequently, uh, we don't all live in the same house, literally, amen? Praise God for that. <laughs> no offense, that would be crazy. Um, but when you're together that much, there's conflict. Conflict happens. Jesus already knew this. And he taught us how to handle it. But more importantly, he, he taught how do we handle and treat each other in, in relation to the reflection that it is on, on his kingdom, how his kingdom operates, and his glory. Ultimately, who he is. Because you really know someone when you see how they live behind closed doors, right? You get to know them better. Like at home, not as a guest, not, um, can't speak for everyone, but when a guest, a new guest comes over first time, what are you going to do? You're going to clean up? <laughs> um, have everything looking good. You want to make a good impression, right? But, but in reality, and for my family, if, if you went to the house now, <laughs> if, if we didn't do that, you're, you're going to find some toilet seats up. You're going to find some dishes in the sink, because I didn't do them this morning. Um, toys on the floor, dog toys, hopefully not any dog, other dog stuff. Um, <laughs> But when, you're, when your closest friends come over, your closest friends, the pretense is gone. And we just are who we are. We don't care. They know us. Who cares? We don't have anything to show, to impress them with. And then when you live with someone permanently, you really get to know them in the context of who they are at home. You're not a stranger anymore. You're not even a guest. You're just... You're living together. Smells, sounds, and all. <laughs> Toothpaste. Anyway, um, <laughs> Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So we are the household. The church is the household of God. What happens in the household of faith has a direct impact on people's lives eternally. When they look, when they look in, when they come in, do they see division? Do they see offenses? Do they see hypocrisy? Do they see selfishness? Do they see strife? They actually should not, according to Scripture, if we are the household of God, if we truly have received the kingdom, and we're, we're living for the king, they should have a good experience in the household of God. And that is why there is such a thing as church discipline, which is the context of the entire book of Matthew 18. And Jesus had just gone into 
Um, how to restore a brother, you know, when they're, or a sister, when they keep doing the same thing over and over again, right? They keep giving into that, giving into that sin, and they've gone through the steps, and we got the, the actual, the context last week of binding and loosing, right? Hopefully that was clear enough. It's in the context of church discipline. So out of that discussion, right before verse 21, right after where two or three are gathered in my name, then they're in the midst of them, when we're making an accusation against someone, when we're dealing with someone, Jesus is right there. And then Peter said, so, so he's coming right out of that. And here's what, here's what Peter says. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Or seven, 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. So Peter's asking, thinking about this, this restoration process, well, how long do we do this? And how many times should I put up with someone, like forgive them? Seven times. And we have that completion number again that's all over Matthew, all over the Bible, but especially in Matthew. He's basically saying, when do we say enough is enough? And I guess he believed that he was being generous because he surpassed the rabbi's idea of how many times we should forgive. The rabbis would put a limit on forgiveness to, th to three times based on an erroneous interpretation of Amos 1, 3, and there's another verse too. It says, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not revoke its punishment. So they, they love to find ways to limit how much they would love people, and they love to find ways to limit moral obligations. They use misinterpretation to make their own rules, basically so they could get away with the wickedness that was in their heart. They wanted to find a loophole. And for them, it was, of course, being able to take vengeance because it feels good. <laughs> our deceitful hearts, ladies and gentlemen, can twist the word of God to make it fit our idea of what we want the kingdom to look like. So, of course, Peter, now he still hasn't, he still hasn't really, he's matured a little bit. He's got a long way to go. So he's like, well, three, I'm going seven. That's good. And Jesus, Jesus says, actually, uh, 70 times seven. Actually, is that 490? Well, no, it's hyperbole. He's saying unlimited. He's saying we always have to forgive. Always. And now that sounds radical, because it is. It's supposed to be radical. So because it's so radical, Jesus explains in a parable to them. Remember, he's talking to his disciples only. And later he would show them, actually show them how at the cross that this is going to be accomplished and why we have to do this. So this parable help, and we can find a nice seven steps just to help you remember it better. Here they are, number one, God must settle accounts. God must settle accounts. 
Matthew 18, 23. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts. So the king in the story represents God. He's doing the settling. For us, we know one day the records of our lives will be taken into account, including what we did with this awesome salvation that we received. What do we do with it? But from the onset, when we first come to Christ, the reality is we are coming to Christ because there is something unsettled in our life. There is, there is unsettled debt. Romans 14, 12 says, so then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Initially, out of that reality, just us living in our sin, something is not right. And in that, in that sinful state, number two, we are brought to the king. It says, when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. So the, it was brought to him. This, the, the, the servant wasn't going, going to the king himself. He'd say, I, I want to go make everything right today. I want to I I I see how much I'm in debt. It wasn't that. He was brought. And, and, you know, we are too. We are brought to the king. It's nothing we do that, that earns that. Our king draws us by, by conviction, by the word and the witness of others, by his spirit, by the preaching of the gospel. That's the Father drawing us in. John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So there's a calling. There's, there's something that, that draws us in, and it's the Father. And when we come to him, well, that's number three. We become aware of our debt. We become aware of our debt. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. So this servant, when he's brought to the king, he realizes, I'm in debt. Debt is a funny thing. It's easy to forget sometimes how much debt you're in until that, uh, until that statement comes in the mail and you open it. Perhaps you have been ignoring them for a while. You open that thing and you look at the statement and you're like, oh man, what have, I, what have I done? What have I done? I know people can relate and you're in trouble. It's a horrible feeling. This servant is faced with the reality that he owed 10,000 talents. Some translations modernize this to millions of dollars. But this is more hyperbole. 10,000 was the highest number in the ancient Greek. And, and the, the, the word literally for 10,000 is, is myriad. So it is a unmeasurable number. Even if it was actually 10,000 talents, a talent was about 6,000 denarius. One denarius was a day's wage. So that would have been 60 million days wages. Um. Imagine finding out, imagine opening that statement. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, you know, remember, remember the times on Wall Street when the financial stuff happened and they jump off buildings. They, they'd commit suicide over this stuff. But this morning, when, when we come to the king and he make, makes us aware of our, our debt, we become aware of it, we're convicted. We realize yeah, we're in debt too. We're in debt to sin. The wages of sin is eternal death. Romans 6.23. That's eternal separation from God. And what, what does it feel like when, you're, when you encounter that? It's, it's, it's more than a, a credit card statement or whatever statement. It's like, it's like Psalm 40. One of my favorite Psalms. But for, Psalm 40.12 says, For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. That's about right. 
When you're face to face with the reality that you are in that kind of debt. And not just debt, but the, 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 the extreme measure of debt that we're in because of sin. So we realize we're in debt. The servant realized he was in debt. And that's number goes to number four. We are all bankrupt. Verse 25 says, and since he could not pay, this servant was bankrupt. There's no way he's going to pay that. So are we in our sins. There's no offering. There's no sacrifice. There's no good works that can make this right. That's why all the Old Testament sacrifices, they only pointed to sin, but they never took care of it. Hebrews 10, 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And then nobody else, no person that's merely a human being can pay for us either. Psalm 49, 7, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. There's no bailout from anyone else. But despite being bankrupt, number five, justice must happen. There has to be justice. His master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had. And payment to be made. The demand for payment was, ev- was everything. Including his family. But that wasn't enough to cover. And, he, and, and the king would have known that. But he had to do something. Well, God has to make things right. He's a just God. He's perfectly just. Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. Are you sure? Yeah, that's what it says. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. So, facing the source of all justice, the one who makes things right, all we can do is, number six, cry for mercy. And that's what the servant did. He fell on his knees, imploring him, please, have mercy on me, I'll pay you everything. And he knows that he can't. He can't. There's no way. But we, we, say some, we say dumb things when we're desperate, right? So we cry out to mercy to a just God. We say, as in Psalm 51, 1, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin. And then comes the seventh step. It's the best step of all. We are forgiven. For the servant and the king says, out of pity, out of compassion for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. All that he owed. Every right to take his family and all, I mean, his whole life, really. And he's like, you know what? You're good. It's fine. Just go. That's powerful. That's amazing grace. That's the first song we sang. That's, the, that's how our new life starts in Christ, is in that kind of encounter where we realize we're, we're in so much debt Literally that it's, it's even one sin, it's eternal separation from God. And nothing we can do to pay him. And we come to him and we ask for forgiveness. And he says, 
oh, you're good. You know what? It's done. Now, out of that, out of that initial confrontation, experience, whatever you want to call it, I can't think of the right word, the salvation experience, out of that is what our lives are supposed to be lived out of, uh, our actions, our, our relationships, everything. Now, Jesus had already been teaching on this to, to his followers. He said, freely you, you receive, freely, freely you give. That's what he's talking about. Because the, the, the kingdom that I'm establishing here is different than this world system. It's different than the religious system. It's different than the, the Roman political system. It's a whole different kingdom. And all through it, all those kingdoms are clashing. And they, they still don't fully get it, of course. But here, the servant in this parable, he doesn't stay at number seven. And all that joy and all that realization of what this merciful king had did, done for him, right? Instead, he takes seven steps backwards. And basically, you, you can see every, every step he goes back. Let's read in verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his feather, fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I'll pay you. He refused and went out and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should, should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant? Just as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt which was impossible. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. The first thing he does is out of that mercy that he received is go out to find a brother who owed him a hundred denarius. Not even a millionth of what he owed if you went by, if you're not taking it as hyperbole, if it's actually 10,000 talents. And he chokes him. Literally. That's what it means in the original language. That's what he did. Demanding payment. Are you serious? Is that what you do with freedom? Sounds like he had the wrong idea about his king. Sounds like often how we as humans have the wrong idea about God. So his brother, he cries out with the same words that he once spoke, have patience with me. And who is witnessing all of this? The community, the fellow servants, and they are in distress over what's going on because they saw the mercy that he received, they saw the freedom and the change, and now he is the epitome. It's of hypocrisy. And he's summoned again, but not for a pardon this time. He's, he's summoned for torture. Torture! Some of your translations have torture. And this is reality this morning. For us. If, if we do not, if we fail to forgive, it's, it's torture here to start, but then it's torture in the future if we do not repent. Because any offense that we have 
from someone else, any sin that someone else has sinned against us, and we are talking servant, brother, or sister in Christ. We're talking for sure in this context right now, those people you look to your left and your right this morning in the body of Christ, what they have done to you or what you may have perceived they've done to you because when you're living with people, it's easy to, you, you, things happen like the wrong look and we interpret things wrong. We pick up offenses easier the more time we spend with one another, right? It's nothing compared to the debt that every single one of us are in to God because of sin. And none of us could have ever paid it. See, this servant forgot somehow, I don't know that we don't have the time frame, like how soon did he go out there? I don't know. But he forgot the pardon that he received. Whether it be at pride, probably greed, obviously, even though, man, a big financial difference there. Self-righteousness. He fell. So failing to forgive in our community, the body of Christ, is forgetting what we received at the cross. We have to remember. We have to remember. And call me crazy, but I think this is what Jesus said. Yeah, there it is. I think he said, I think he said, do this in remembrance of me. With the communion verses, right? I mean, it's on that thing back there, the, the table, the wood. It's carved in there. Do this in remembrance of me. Communion. He was talking to a community. It's the church. All of us here, family. And we're taking communion. We're remembering the price that was paid for us because of that state that we're in, realizing our bankruptcy. And he, he, he let us go. He pardoned us. We can never pay for it ourselves. And we're all taking part of that. And out of that, we're living free. And the freedom that we have is the freedom to forgive others because of the freedom that we've been given. Not choking them for petty offenses in our minds, which is what we do if we're forgetting the cross or imprisoning people in our minds by refusing to speak to them, to oust them in the body of Christ, to turn our backs on them because of an offense we're holding on to. Within the very community that's supposed to represent the household, the house of God to the world. And you're really, we're really enslaving ourselves, but it's not a self thing because it's, it's affecting us all. Which is why those servants in the parable are distressed. Because it's affecting the community. Because a divided family is a bad witness it is a bad witness if you come to my house and I, I'm beating up my wife. I just ruined not only my witness, but it's really not my witness. It's the witness of, of Christ, of his body, of his bride. Onlookers see that, and then the visitors, they're taking note because, especially in church, I mean, church shopping, it's hard. You're like, okay, what are they going to say? Is this pastor preaching the word? Is it, is it I like this? And, 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 and they, they, they see this. And because of our refusal to forgive as the body, someone walks away saying, if, if, that's, if that's the kind of king they represent, I don't want anything to do with it. Nothing. Why do I want that? Most of us come from broken homes anyway in America, probably statistically. Me into this new broken home. I don't want that. Look how they're treating each other. It's distressing. I'm out. Even if you think or you have the right to, to, to avenge, right? Because 
Many of us have been wronged by other people, and we feel so justified in return. Go when they, or I'm not forgiving unless, and we fill in the blanks. We feel like we need time, right? You know, one, one, yeah, one day I'll forgive. I'm working on that. I'm working on that. The question, what if your demands are never met? Never. Don't you remember the price that was paid for you? How do I forgive? I can't. And I, I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to find the answer, like, in a practical way, just so I could make it easy and a cookie-cutter kind of message, right? Like, oh, yeah, you just do this, and then it's done. I think I found the answer. Luke 7, 41. Then Jesus told, told him this story. We've got another loan story, another debt story coming up. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more, than, more after that? Here he is. Simon answered. I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Now, I have heard people use this verse to say, like, well, yeah, the people who sin the most, right? Actually, I've heard it for me, for me personally. Well, yeah, pastor's so loving and compassionate because, I mean, the Bible says that those who sin the most are going to love the most, Right? And, and he used to be, you know, a horrible sinner. And we've heard his testimony, that's why. But I don't have that kind of testimony, so I can't be so loving. Do you, do you see the, you, you understand the thinking is wrong there? Because that's like saying you're more able to forgive because you sin more in your past. It's ridiculous. Because we all have the largest debt that he's talking about. All of us, every single one, from Judy Taylor to me. There's a big holiness gap there, right? Because she basically walks on clouds. No. But we all have the largest debt, everything. That, that, that wasn't the point in saying, well, yeah, only the ones who sin more are going to do this. No, it's about what they, what they understand, what they're acknowledging. And we realize that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, and faith is trusting in the authority of Jesus Christ and submitting to that authority. When it's genuine, in the one that paid, paid your debt on that cross, it's going to pour out the love that the kingdom demands. It's going to pour it out. And that includes forgiveness this morning. It, so th here's, here's the answer. If you find it hard to forgive, if you think that you cannot, it's time to go back to the cross. And you revisit it over and over and over again. Remember the price that was paid for you. It was the debt that you could never pay. I can never pay it. You can never pay it. We were bankrupt, we were hopeless, begging for mercy, 10,000 talents behind, a myriad, right? 10,000 reasons to praise the Lord and to forgive, which is unlimited. 70 times seven. So it is possible. 
It's possible in this church. It's possible right here, right now, if you will revisit the cross. And if there's a disassociation there, if there's not an understanding of what, what he did for you, it's not like you can just go rent the Passion of the Christ and watch it over and over to finally get it. I mean, maybe that would help. But if you're here today and you're a believer and you're in this community, and this community, by the way, it stretches beyond the walls of Foundation Church. So I'm not only bound to forgive people in this body, it's any other body here in, 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 in this town, in, in, this, in this nation, anywhere. It has to be. Because they're looking, the world is looking, and people's lives are at stake. And it's affecting us. And he's so patient. God is so patient. He's warning and, and, and wooing over and over again, but you know our days are numbered, right? I mean, how, how much longer? How, how much more? I mean, how, how stubborn was I? How stubborn are we? I'm going to give you an example of a really stubborn guy this morning. I'm going to give you a real-life example, and I have their permission to use this illustration. Great friends. Great friends, great Christian brothers. One's name is Bob. Where is he? He's somewhere. There he is. Just come on up here. We'll just do it. We'll do it. We'll make it real. And, and, and Tom. Tom's not here this morning. What'd you say to me? Start with you were friends, and then what happened, and then go for it. We were best friends. We were in a 20s fellowship Bible study, so we've known each other since we were 22 or 23. I'd call him my best friend, and uh, <clears throat> he also sandblasts and paints things, not water towers, but other things. And we bid on the same project, and we talked about it, and there was a, a terrible miscommunication and I thought he had wronged me, and it, uh, it ruined our friendship. And for four years, maybe, maybe five years, we didn't speak. And it didn't, it didn't just bother me after a few years. It bothered me the next day, and the next month, and the next year. But I thought I was right which I usually am. <laughs> so I was waiting for him to apologize to me. And over the years, thinking about it, going back, having it just really hurt, it really hurt me. I, I thought, maybe I'm wrong. And uh, a couple more years went by of thinking that. And... <clears throat> I got really tired of waking up in the middle of the night and thinking about my best friend. And I was losing sleep, and it was starting to irritate me. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning, I called him. <laughs> and I apologized. And, and I was crying and begging his forgiveness. And uh, <clears throat> after going through all that, giving him a moment, he said... You know what time it is, don't you? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, there's, there's nothing to forgive. I, I love you. No time passed between us. We went back to the relationship that we had as if it never happened. Amen. That's the way to the healthy body. And that's the cool thing. It's like no time passed. Restoration. Would you close your eyes this morning? Come on. Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
the choice is yours this morning. You have the ability to forgive, release, according to the great releaser who released us of all our debt, the one who paid for it all. So this morning, wherever that that name is in your heart, that person who makes you uncomfortable, that thing, maybe like, like Bob waking you up at three in the morning, not asking you to shout out names. We're not going to nail names to the cross. Nothing like that. But this morning, we have to revisit the cross. We have to return. Why are we in the faith? Because we're a family. It's a community. An eternal one. And the Holy Spirit is crying out, forgive, forgive, forgive. Stop holding on. And he'll restore relationships you thought were irreconcilable. Because he can do that. That's how powerful he is. This morning, just in your hearts, in the depths of your hearts, in your minds, remember the price that was paid for you. If you don't understand that price, And you're like, well, I really don't get that yet. That's a decision you have to make this morning. To understand that this is not just some fairy tale. This is a reality. God sent his only begotten son. Jesus came in the flesh. He had already existed eternally. But he came in the flesh, was born as a helpless infant. To grow up. Walk with us. Love us. Teach us how to walk. Institute this church community. It's not another religion. It's an eternal family. He set that up. He taught his followers how to do that. And then he went to the cross. And he died a criminal's death to pay the price for those who can never pay for themselves and that's every single one of us really we're just beggars that's all we are we are hopeless without him we are in debt 10,000 reasons a myriad of debt that we can never pay but he says you're good just receive my forgiveness I love you so much that's what he did for you on the cross And he rose from the dead and he sent his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit's here this morning and his Holy Spirit's the one who's doing the convicting. And he's calling you to a life style of forgiveness. Not only for your sake to be free, but to free the body of Christ to do what she is meant to do and reach people, to adopt them into a new family. And when they're adopted in, it's like they were always family. It is as they were always family because there's no wrong scene anymore. Love covers a multitude of sin. 10,000 multitude. Thank you, Father. Lord, as we leave here this morning, God, we pray for waves, Lord waves of your Holy Spirit, God, to touch every heart. Lord, I pray for relationships even in this building this morning, Lord, where there was offenses, they will be reconciled, they will be made right, Lord, according to your nature, but looking to what you've done for us on the cross first, and out of that, Lord, help us, God, we need help. But you've promised us that you'll help us. You've promised us that you'll never leave us or forsake us no matter what the damage has been done. This morning, Lord, we pray you work through us and in us to represent a community of forgiveness to the world, Lord. In Jesus' name.